This morning comes from Isaiah, and it says, O Lord, be gracious to us who long for you. Be our strength every can't read that one. morning, our salvation in time of distress. You will be the rich, sure, the sure foundation of our times, a rich store of salvation and wisdom and knowledge, the fear of the Lord is the key to this treasure.
just thank you that we can gather here this evening. And we know that we're all broken people, but we're yours. We're your children. And it's not anything that we do, but just what you've done for us. And you still look on us with favor even through our weakness. We just thank you for that, Lord. And we just ask that 
you strengthen us and just be with us tonight. Let us hear your word, what, what you want to speak on our hearts. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Old Testament reading tonight is from 1 Samuel chapter 2. We're doing two weeks in preparation for Thanksgiving coming up, national holiday, kind of squeeze into our busy lives, a time to stop and give thanks, be thankful. We order our children, be thankful, time to be thankful right now. National holiday, be thankful. And one of the struggles that we have as a culture in families as individuals is what if we don't really feel too thankful what are we thankful for and how do we generate that feeling inside on schedule we're looking at a bizarre old testament reading tonight strange why do i pick these things <laughs> okay 1 Samuel chapter 2, starting in verse 12 and reading down to verse 17. This is part of what generated the call to Samuel, who was born by miraculous birth, and after his mother got him, she gave him back to be raised in the temple family. But he was not a Levite. He was not a priest. Hmm. Starting in verse 12. Eli's son, Eli is the high priest of the nation at that time. Eli's son's were scoundrels. They had no regard for the Lord. Now it was the practice of the priests that whenever any of the people offered a sacrifice, the priest's servant would come with a three-pronged fork in his hand while the meat was being boiled and would plunge the fork into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. Whatever the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. This is how they treated all the Israelites who came to Shiloh. But even before the fat was burned, the priest's servant would come and say to the person who was sacrificing, Give the priest some of the meat to roast. He won't accept boiled meat from you, only raw. If the person said to him, Let the fat be burned first, then take whatever you want, the servant would answer, No, hand it over now. If you don't, I'll take it by force. This sin of the young men was very great in the Lord's sight, for they were treating the Lord's offering with contempt. Our New Testament reading is found in the book of Luke, chapter 12. Bear in mind, this is preparation for Thanksgiving. Why do I pick these things? It's weird. Luke, chapter 12. Starting in verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you. Then he said to them all, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place for my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. Who then will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. I selected the famous picture of Thanksgiving 
The family all gathered around, one weird guy peeking in here in the corner. The gigantic turkey, it's gotta be a 30 pounder, roasted absolutely perfectly, all the trimmings all the way around, fancy nice table, everything set just exactly right. And I titled tonight's message, Preparing for Thanksgiving, part one. The challenge of entitlement. The two stories that we read that have to do with Eli's family. Eli was the high priest. He was in charge of the spiritual welfare of an entire nation. One of the things that's amazing about both Old Testament and New Testament stories is how many events, how many anecdotes, how many real-life dramas occur when men and women who are truly great before God raise families of scoundrels. And even they themselves twist and turn in the wind, blowing this way and that way, though they have the advantages not of things, but of the Spirit of God and of closeness to Him and what is right to do, it seems frequent. But that doesn't transfer into the ordinariness of life. This story we read from the Old Testament is one of many, many places we could have read. As a matter of fact, in the book of Luke, we read from chapter 12, I picked a number of different, just short anecdotes that indicate Jesus warned his followers against becoming an insider, against seeing oneself as having entitlement. It's amazing how often he spoke about it. It's frequent, very, very frequent. In Luke chapter 14, just a little bit after where we read, in verses 7 through 11, Jesus is invited as a guest. He's a guest at a Pharisee's house. Pharisees in that day were incredibly important people, socially, politically well-connected. They were highly regarded by the community. They didn't have evil scowls and wear these awful clothes. They believed thoroughly they were doing the right thing with their whole heart. But they were insiders. They were consummate insiders. And they regarded themselves as having rights, privileges ordinary things that just belong to them. And so when Jesus is at this table, he paid attention, the scripture says, as Luke describes the story, to how everybody was maneuvering around the room, picking the best seats around the table. What order should I be in? How do I get close to the host? I don't want to sit right next to the kitchen. How do I get close to Jesus, but not so close that I appear to be a follower? but I can check him out and be seen with him at a photo op in case they get out a chisel and sketch me real quick. That's how they did it back then. And Jesus says, be very careful about having an attitude of entitlement. That somehow you've earned a good seat at the house. That you ought to be seen with the right people. Think carefully about that. As he's watching the Pharisees, In Luke chapter 9, verses 51 through 55, he is walking with his disciples through Samaria. Samaritans were seen as scum, filth, dirt under their feet. They were half-breeds. They were compromisers of the pure faith. They didn't really deserve to live and certainly not breathe the same air that we pure Jews breathe. And so when they walked along, they went to a town And the town of Samaritans looked at Jesus and said, we don't want you here. We're not interested in you. We don't think like you. We we don't really want you to stay here. Keep moving. And James and John are indignant. They're upset about that. They say, Jesus, would you like us to call down fire out of heaven and burn them up? You know, they deserve it. We can do it. And Jesus rebukes his followers. He rebukes James and John. In essence, he says, beware of a sense of entitlement. 
Don't think, because you know me, that somehow that gives you rights over people you don't like, over people that are different than you, over people who don't respond. That's between them and me, not between them and you. Be very careful about entitlement. In Luke chapter 7, a little earlier in the gospel, he's eating at another Pharisee's house, verses 36 through 50. It's a fairly long passage. And the Pharisee did not provide the ordinary comforts of the day to Jesus. Just invited him in, but didn't wash his feet, didn't anoint his hair, didn't take care of the normal things that an important guest would have in the house. The Pharisee wanted to be seen with him, but really didn't want to engage him. But there was a woman, various translations are quite delicate about how they reveal this woman's background. She was a woman of the street. Some are come right out and say she was a prostitute of ill repute. And in that day, houses weren't closed off like they are now. The house was in a fairly open courtyard, and she had come in and brought her own perfume. She didn't pick up the Pharisee's perfume out of his toiletries and then use that. He was, she wasn't generous with someone else's supply. She was sacrificial with her own. Now, it could very well be that Jesus, knowing all things, just knew what was going on in his mind. It could have been his face just betrayed his heart, that he was snide and negative and condescending about this woman. And he thought, if he only knew what kind of woman this was, he would not let her touch him. He has a sense in himself. I have the right to warn Jesus about this other person touching him. Their relationship is my privilege. And Jesus addresses that in the Pharisee. Be very careful about a sense of entitlement. You're sitting in a beautiful home. You have a beautiful table. You ignored the basics. She hasn't. She has nothing. She's not coming from where you're coming from. She doesn't have your advantages. She doesn't think like you. But when she touches me, that's what I want. I want to connect. And you don't have any business judging that. Be very careful about entitlement. Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 through 28. A fascinating little anecdote Jesus' biological mother, brought about by the power of the Holy Spirit to give birth to Jesus as God's only son, had a sister. Her sister had married a nice, hardworking guy named Zebedee. And in their family, they had two sons, James and John. As Jesus was beginning to engaged those who were from his community, he took two of his own cousins as disciples. And his aunt came up to him and says, Jesus, I have a favor to ask you. You have a favor. Could my two sons sit at your right hand and your left hand? But we're insiders. We belong. But in a sense, you owe us. It's a fascinating little moment. And Jesus says to her, you have no idea what you're asking for. Because your perspective is so earth-connected. You think it's about privilege. I think it's about sacrifice. You think it's about being recognized. I think it's about being pointed out. You think it's about identity. I think it's about being identified with the Messiah who will die. And it will come your way. What you're asking for is not mine to give. Be very careful about a sense of entitlement. 
You see, the one thing that really seems to interrupt in Thanksgiving is a very profoundly Western American ideal. I have rights. They're mine. I own them. They're guaranteed to me by the force of the Constitution, by the writ of law, by social convention. That's what I deserve. I have rights. Legal rights are based on a value encoded from philosophy, very earthly philosophy, by the way, not biblical philosophy, but very earthly philosophy from the 16th and 17th century, when the founders of our country encoded in slightly different words that all men, only meaning white European men at the time, are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights of life, liberty, and property. And then they took the word property out and said, no, the pursuit of happiness. Those were rights. And it was communicated that the average citizen could have a higher sense of esteem, could think well of himself or herself because of rights that were guaranteed by the Constitution. They belonged to each citizen. And it came, in essence, from the earthly philosophy of humankind. We convinced ourselves that's how we function in this world. We have rights. No one can tell us we don't. There was a huge debate in the 18th century as the United States was being formed between natural rights and assigned rights. Did these come from creation itself, or do we have to agree that there are rights to be recognized and enforced? It was a huge debate, and it wasn't settled then it isn't settled now. Positive rights versus negative rights, things that I can do, things you can't tell me I can't do. And one of the big debates about all law is do we write them positively, what must be done, or do we write them negatively, what can't be prevented? It's a huge debate, it's not been settled yet. Individual rights versus group rights became very much a Western ideal, that the individual supersedes the group in every turn, but then there's a whole set of community rights and rights within groups that individuals don't have. It became a big challenge to define, do we have the individual triumphing over the group or over the community or over the whole of humanity? And is, in fact, one person equal to all. It was a, a debate that wasn't solved at that time. Animal rights and workers' rights and homeowners' rights and on and on and on. There's every kind of rights. You can plant rights. I heard of a bizarre group that is now saying cauliflower and broccoli should not be slaughtered for the consumption of human beings. What? And the vast majority of people eventually say, come on, that's ridiculous. But when the, the topic of rights themselves come up, it's not seen as ridiculous at all. But with Jesus, it is. That becomes one of the great challenges. The concept of rights has crept into the very nature of our language. Of course, we have the word right, but the word straight means direct in a line. That's what a right is. It comes to me. I can walk on it rightly. Straight includes the word right. Erect is something that has been turned to stand straight up. It's a right. It's set in the right way. A rectangle has right angles inside. It has rights that make it that way. The word correct is from a German word, recht, which means rights. It's crept right into everything we say. And there's probably 10 other key words that have built in them. I've got rights. That's what makes it all work. The problem is that a sense of entitlement, the claim of rights, is what wars against thankfulness. True gratitude, a heart of wonderment, 
as to what God is doing, what God has done, and what God will do. A heart of thankfulness becomes undermined by a belief in entitlement. You see, a person may have the idea that I'm a servant. Everything I have comes from God. But still have a belief in right. I won't be treated that way. I don't deserve that. You don't know who you're talking to. It's a fascinating tension between what we think and what we actually believe. And the root of it is in that sense that I'm entitled to what I have, where I go, who I am. The story of the sons of Eli, the high priest, is an amazingly tragic event out of which arises a prophet, not a high priest. Moses had been a prophet. The Levitical priesthood was established at Sinai. It was the right way to create a, a living legacy of relationship between God and mankind. But by the time of Eli, it had been ruined. Eli was absorbed with being a top guy, and his kids took advantage of it. And the nation suffered as a result. That whole thing about the raw meat and the cooked meat, anyone who's done turkey, and when it's really well done in the bag, and you stick a fork in and say, I'm going to get the first piece, and you jam your fork and you get these little shreds because the meat is so soft and tender. You do that when the turkey hasn't been cooked yet, you stab your fork and you pull the whole thing out. You get all 20 pounds. But not when it's been boiled, and that's what they were doing. They were sticking the fork in, and if you got a portion for your meal, that's the way the priest was fed. The boys didn't like that. We deserve better. We're not going to be treated like that. I want meat before it's boiled. No. There was even pushback. You don't have the right to do that. Yeah? You don't know who you're talking to. We're Eli's sons. We can do what we want. It was that sense of entitlement that actually rotted out the priesthood in that day. And Samuel rose up to be a mighty prophet speaking for God. And here's one of the incredible tragedies. I didn't read the rest of 1 Samuel. But Samuel's own sons did the same thing that Eli's sons did. It's amazing to see that happen. That the ability to even have the power of speaking the word of God was not enough to keep that next generation humble and open and recognizing everything that has come into our hands has come from God. We sang a couple of songs at the beginning of this service that have all the right words but may not actually seep down into our heart. That who I am and what I have is not my right. It's not my possession. I don't claim it. Everything I have is a gift, an incredible gift. I'm really just a breath of wind. And I utterly depend on God. There's an amazing story of somebody in a crowd situation yelling out to the famous Jesus, make my brother split our inheritance with me. What? Jesus even pushes back on that. Who may be an arbiter of your family's dispute? But then he tells a story about a man who lived by his entitlement. Look at what I have. Look how much I've produced. I need barns for myself. I need to contain all this wonder, all this glory, all this wealth, all this privilege. I worked for that. This is my right. And Jesus says, really? Tonight you're going to meet God. Who's going to get it wrong? The challenge of preparing for Thanksgiving truly is that sometimes we have to deal with rotted things that are in the refrigerator before the good things can come. To be able to say a heart of gratitude, true wonder, 
at who God is and what he has done addresses that sense of personal privilege. That I have a right to it. That it belongs to me. And no one can take it away. See, the reality is that what Scripture communicates consistently is all that I have, everything, are not on the basis of right. That is the human way of thinking. But these are gifts from Almighty God to His children. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, what have you given us? When we drive down the street, we think we have the right to the road. No one should cut us off. When we get our paycheck, we have the right to spend it any way we want. We're not stewards sharing what really belongs to you. It's, it's our stuff. When we look at our children, our families, or our position, in the context of our lives, we first of all think, you're not treating me that way. I have rights. But you took off your robe. You became a servant. Not just to 12 men centuries ago, but to us.
the good news again is we haven't been turned down for our loan. However, our commercial loan agent has completed her presentation and it is in the hands of the underwriter. And so now it's, we are going to see what happens. Um, it, it at least was gone by middle of last week. So uh, Dan Cuba told me that they are, they are considering the presentation. They did not need any more information. Our project was complete as presented. And so now we see what happens. So, uh, so be consistent, if not urgent, in prayer. And uh, we'll wait for God to open the door. We have uh, other uh, new changes are occurring. We had quite a number of people that joined or moved up in their membership last week, and uh, new leaders and new trustees. And so as we uh, begin setting ourselves for the 2015 year, uh, keep our new, new people and new uh, leaders in your prayers. Do any of you have a special request you'd like to add to our list tonight as we get ready to sing and pray together? No, I'm not. <laughs> the bowls are there. You want to donate? Donate. You don't want to? Don't. Yes, sir. <coughs> sure. She did write on Facebook that she's terrified of going over bridges, and there's four massive bridges <laughs> between here and Toronto. So keep her hands on the wheel tightly as she goes over. <laughs> Keep telling prayer. Our prayer song tonight is Overcome.
tendency to pick the best places to sit. Who should we be seen with? We, of course, want to be seen with you, but we still have our eye on other things. We know the right words, but our hearts have not been humble. desire is not to obliterate us or destroy us, crush us into dust. It is that where you lead, that's where we follow. You could really impress the whole world with lightning flashes and the moon turning to blood and the sea rising up angels from heaven on every corner of the earth. You could really impress people, but you don't. You could make them take notice of you, but you serve. You could lay claim to everything that you own that belongs in your hands, but you don't. You give. So where you lead, we want to follow. We want to be there where you are. We need your help in rooting out the deep roots. That cause us to treat others and to even treat ourselves. And most importantly, to treat you private possessions that will do us some good if we just say the right words and move the right way. It's not about that. Thanksgiving's a national holiday. It comes on the schedule. We're done with it. We tear that page off and go on to other things. But you've asked us to be different. You've given us a model of a different kind of life altogether. And you've given us your spirit that we might live that life differently. We don't ask for a loan from the bank because we deserve a church. We don't want to be able to build a facility because we have the right to do so. served enough to earn the right. What we have is a gift. A real gift. An authentic, unimaginable gift. And we want to walk where you lead. Lift up our requests, our church, our families and friends. Some of the people we know are being brought real, real low. And they are discovering through very painful, traumatic, tragic ways every breath is a gift. us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever.
promise for today comes from Romans chapter 15, verses 5 through 6. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ. Jesus, so that with one heart and mouth you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. known through all generations. I will declare that your love stands firm forever, that you established your faithfulness in heaven itself. Amen. Jonathan. Everyone have a wonderful weekend. <laughs>